Hello everyone, this is Pastor Tommy McMurtry back again from the Liberty Baptist Church in Rock Falls, Illinois. You are listening to the Spirit of Liberty broadcast. We hope you get a blessing from this program. We're on every Sunday morning from 9.15 to 9.45 a.m. And if you ever miss one of these programs, check out our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Baptist. And you can watch all of these programs. Uh, we have a playlist on there. And you can check out any that you may have missed. We always have interesting guests on this program discussing very important topics that I think uh, need to be addressed, especially in our uh, local area. I like to cover uh, subjects that come up quite a bit when talking to people in the community. Our church, we go out regularly knocking doors, inviting people to church, trying to give the gospel to people. And so I like to address a lot of the issues that come up when talking to people in the community. I imagine if, if I talk to three or four people out there knocking on their doors and they're expressing interest in a certain subject, there's probably many more that need to hear the scripture on this subject. And, and so in today's uh, discussion, I'm going to be flying solo in this one, but I want to talk about the importance of church attendance. Okay. I believe that church attendance is very, very important. And unfortunately, there are many people today who are out there who claim to be Christians, and they may very well be Christians, who claim to be saved and on their way to heaven, and they may very well be on their way to heaven. But for one reason or another, they have decided to forsake the assembling of the, themselves, and they have gotten out of church. They do not attend church. And sadly, I heard about another church here recently in the area that just closed their doors. And that seems to be the case with many churches. Our church has been here for almost eight years and the Lord has been blessing our church. Our church has been growing, but in the eight years we've been here, we've seen many churches close their doors and there's not a new ones opening up, taking their place. Church attendance is dwindling in our country. The statistics are are not good on this subject. Many people are getting out of church. And there's a lot of reasons for that, folks. Churches are going bad. Uh, many of the things that people bring up, many of the concerns they have about church, it's legit. There's a lot of bad churches out there. There's a lot of bad preachers out there. There's a lot of false doctrine that has gotten into churches. There's a lot of perversion that has made it into churches. There's perverts in the pulpit, even in our own community. There's examples of that and in some of the surrounding areas. So I get the concern that people have, but the truth is they're not all bad. And the truth is God still expects us to go to church. Yet many people, they've made up a bunch of excuses. And I want to kind of cover some of these today. And I just want to show you from the Bible why church attendance is very important. And you can be a person who's saved and not go to church and you're still going to go to heaven. But I will say this, if you are saved and you are not going to church, you are not right with God. You're in disobedience to God and you need to get right with God and you need to go to church. There's many people maybe listening to this radio program right now. You know you should be going to church. And you're going to be tempted to just tune me out and say, I'm not going to listen to this because you don't want to get convicted, which is one of the things that got you out of church. You couldn't handle being convicted of your sins. You couldn't handle a preacher getting up and telling you where you were wrong and, and proving it from the Bible. You can't handle that. Our snowflake generation can't handle being told they're wrong in anything. But folks, you need to listen to this. All right. Hear me out on this subject. You need to hear the scriptures on this. You need to be in church. And so uh, let me just share a few scriptures with you when it comes to church. And you know, every pastor's favorite verse in the Bible is Hebrews 10, 25. Let's start reading in verse 24. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to say it right now. If you don't attend church, it's because you are thinking of yourself. And, and I know this is the truth. I talk to people all the time who've gotten out of church and they give me their excuses on a regular basis. I hear it every week when I'm out soul winning, when we invite people to church. And they'll all, you know, so I'm just not getting anything out of it. Well, we see in Hebrews 10, 24, 
One of the reasons we're supposed to be going is considering one another to provoke unto love and good works. You know what? Maybe you're not getting anything because you're not giving anything. The truth is we don't go to church. We're not supposed to be going to church just to get. We're supposed to be going to church to give. You're not supposed to go to church just so you can get encouraged and just so you can get a blessing. You are supposed to be going to church to try to be a blessing to someone else. You're supposed to be provoking to others to love and good work. You know, many people today, they get aggravated. They get convicted on Sunday afternoon when they go out to eat and they see those people that all come in to the restaurant. You can tell that they've just been in church. That bothers them. You know why that bothers you? Because you seeing people leave church like that, it provokes you. It tells you, you know, I probably should have been doing that. You feel bad if you're going, you're getting your boat all hooked up and ready to go out on the lake and you see your neighbors coming out, dressed up in their Sunday go to meetings, carrying their Bibles, that bothers you because you know it's what you're supposed to be doing. But understand those people that are in their Sunday go to meetings that are carrying their Bibles, they're doing what they're supposed to do and they're provoking you under good works because you ought to be going, but you're too busy thinking about yourself and that's your real problem. You're thinking about you and no one else. And the truth is God wants us to be a part of a congregation. Many people think, oh, I can worship the Lord just fine on my own. And you know, you can worship God on your own. You can read your Bible on your own. You can pray, but there's some things that God wants us to do in a group, in a congregation. You can praise God on your own. You can give thanks to God on your own, and you should do those things, but you should also do it in an assembly of believers. It says in Psalms 35, 18, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Right there we see, you know, it's a good thing to praise God in front of other people. Now, listen, if you're not comfortable enough to praise God in front of much people in a church, in, in a building full of people who are there to worship God, you know, I promise you're not going to do it in a different kind of congregation. You say, well, that doesn't necessarily mean church. You know, I can do that at the ball game. Okay. I want to see you praise God at the ball game then. I want to see you get up in a baseball game and start, you know, singing praises to God. I guarantee you won't do that because you'll probably get beer thrown on you. So uh, this is clearly talking about church coming together to worship. It says in Psalms 107, 31, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Psalms 111, 1. Praise you the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Where are you going to find that assembly of the upright? You're going to find it in the house of God amongst the saints, amongst saved people. It says in Psalms 149, 1, praise you the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the congregation of saints. So, Right there, we see, while you can do all those things on your own, you can give thanks on your own, and that's good. You can praise God on your own. You can worship on your own. God wants us doing some things, too, also along with that in an assembly of believers. Why do we do that? Because it's encouraging. It motivates other people. But people who don't go to church are self-centered people. Period, all right? And I'm going to offend a lot of people with stuff I'm saying, but the truth offends, okay? People who don't go to church are self-centered people, and they often think they're better than everybody else. That's one of the reasons you don't like church. You don't like the assemblies. You don't like congregations because those congregations aren't good enough for you. You're better than everybody else in those congregations in your own mind, and you don't want to be around you know, flawed people. And so you think you're going to do better just, you know, having home church, you know, doing things on your own. And the truth is you're not, okay? You are a selfish person. You're self-centered. And listen, if you're just some lost person out there, you know, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who claim to be born again, children of God who don't go to church, all right? If you're just lost, okay, you got a whole bunch of other issues. This, this is not, this is not for you. But many people today, you know, they think that, 
you know, you can just have church on your own at home. And a lot of times the verse that they'll go to, they'll go to uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. It says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And I love when people bring that up because it just shows their ignorance of the scripture and shows to they didn't look at context. All right. So let's think about that for a second. So, you know, you uh, and I've had this conversation many times with people. I'll tell them, listen, you ought to go to church. And I was like, well, I can do it just fine on my own, you know, where two or three are gathered. So as long as it's just me and my wife, that's two, you know, and three, you know, that's one of our children, you know, God is in the midst. Okay. But here's, here's the thing. All right. Your family's always gathered together. All right. This is talking about people being gathered together in his name. All right. My family, when we're together, we're gathered in my name, in the name of McMurtry. It's all McMurtry's that live in the McMurtry household. And McMurtry's do a lot of things in the name of McMurtry because we are one family. We are a single unit. Okay. But a congregation, they come together in the name of Jesus Christ. That is that is a completely separate gathering. Okay. Your home church gathering, which is you and your wife and your kids. That is not an assembling of the believers. That is not an example of what we see in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Matthew 18, verse 20 itself proves that, you know, your home church thing doesn't count. Now, I'm all for churches that meet in a house as long as there are uh, a legitimate two or three gathered in his name. As long as you're coming together in that home in the name of Christ you know, you're having a public assembly there. Many churches start out that way, but you know, the right ones don't want to stay that way. They want to eventually grow and they want to get a bigger place, a more public place, uh, you know, and starting out in a house is fine, but your goal shouldn't be to end in a house and it needs to be legit. But let's look at Matthew chapter 18. Let's look at the few verses before verse 20 and you'll see how ridiculous it is when people use this verse to prove that just their family having their little worship service together counts as church, okay? Because it doesn't. But Matthew 18, verse 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Okay. If you're having a conflict with somebody, they had a, a law in the old Testament, you know, you get two or three witnesses. And when you're having this conflict here, you know, you can, every word can be established in the mouth or of two or three witnesses. That's something that's being talked about right here. And it says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church under the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man, and a publican. So it's talking about a church here. And if this guy is not willing to submit to the authority of the church in this situation, in this conflict between brethren, then you know what you do? You let him be as a heathen man or a publican. You put him out of the church. Okay, He's not going to be a part of the church anymore. And then it says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. So right here, we see the context of that verse is just showing how God recognizes the authority of a congregation. When a congregation of believers comes together, God recognizes the authority that they have when there's two or three who can agree on something. When two or three are gathered together in his name, he's there in the midst, meaning he's a part of that. He recognizes their authority and what they are doing is legitimate. Because often what people will come up with too, you know, show me in the Bible where, you know, they ran the church service, did, you know, this way and where they did this, where they did that, where they met in this type of building or whatever. And they'll come up with all these little details of things that are pretty common in church. And you say, show me that in the Bible. You know what? Maybe I can't show you where we see that particular thing in the Bible, but I can show you that where two or three are gathered in his name. He's in the midst. 
you know, and the, when we come together agreeing on something as we as a congregation, if we agree to run our service in this way or to do this uh, work as a church, God recognizes our authority to do that. God has given churches the authority to do certain things. And there's some differences that, you know, are in uh, different churches. It's not every church runs things the same way. Even in a Baptist church, there are differences in how the services run, how business is conducted. Uh, there's a lot of differences that you can see. But if that congregation is in agreement, then God is also in agreement with that. He recognizes the legitimacy of what they are doing. So now, having looked at all that, can you imagine someone and can you imagine my face and my horror when I hear people try to use Matthew 18, 20 to justify their little home church with just their family? I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. You have just butchered the scriptures is what you've done to just go along with something you've already decided that you want to do. You have no scriptural basis in doing that. And so you know, it's clear in the Bible too. I mean, just the fact that many of the epistles that we see in the Bible, Paul's epistles, they are written to churches. And we see too, the book of Revelation, it's written to seven churches. This is something that we just see throughout the New Testament. We see churches, we see assemblies of believers together. And much of the Bible, it's written two churches. And what's interesting about churches, all right, back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. If you look at the context of Hebrews 10, 25, when he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, because one of the things he's trying to show there is that we are still supposed to be assembling together. Many people would see, uh, you know, what they would say to the verses I brought up in Psalms, they would say, well, that's Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. You know, we're in the New Testament era. You know, we don't sacrifice lambs anymore. And that's true. We don't sacrifice lambs anymore. You know why? Because Hebrew, the book of Hebrews tells us we don't need to. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was that sacrifice for us. Jesus, uh, you know, the book of Hebrews tells us that we have a better high priest. We don't have a high priest anymore. There's a lot of things that we don't have anymore. The book of Hebrews tells us all these things. The book of Hebrews tells us we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore, that we don't need to keep the feasts anymore. The book of Hebrews tells us that. And while the book of Hebrews is telling us all these things we don't need to do anymore, when he gets to chapter 10, one thing he tells us that we should continue to do, though, is the assembling of the believers, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. While some people had gotten rid of the sacrifices like they should have, they had gotten rid of the Sabbaths and the feasts like they should have, some of them decided to throw out the assembling of themselves together too. They weren't supposed to do that. That was inappropriate. And that's why he said, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. One of the reasons many churches are closing down is the leadership has given up. The pastors has given, has given up. The congregation has given up because they are discouraged because of just the lack of participation. People don't want to attend anymore. People don't want to give towards these things anymore. They would much rather spend their time fishing, uh, going to the movies. They'd much rather spend their money, you know, buying things for themselves instead of giving towards the work of the Lord and giving towards missions and things like that. They've decided they want other things instead. And it has discouraged many people and a lot of people, a lot of saved people, they've just given up. They've just quit. And it's because other people failed to provoke them to love and good works. They have failed to exhort them. And you know what? We ought to be faithful no matter what. I intend to be faithful no matter what. I intend to keep going to church even if nobody else does. You know, I, I, I intend to do that. But you know what? You know, I could get discouraged. I could give up and quit. I'm not planning on it. But you know what? I'm thankful that right now, I've got people that are provoking me to love and good works. I'm glad that I've got people that are exhorting me and encouraging me every week when they come and they show up in our services. That encourages me. It motivates me to want to keep studying 
And it motivates me to want to just keep preaching a heart and uh, just giving them something from the word of God. It motivates me to do that. And I thank God for these people. You say, well, the preaching of my church is lame. Well, maybe the preaching of your church is lame because you never encourage the preacher. You know, he doesn't, he, he's, gives into the temptation to not study as much as he should because he doesn't think anybody's going to even be there to listen to it. Listen, if a pastor knows, hey, there's going to be people here that they come to hear the preaching of the word of God. They came to support me and uh, encourage the work of the Lord. You know what? I want to make sure I've got something to give them. You have no idea how much just your attendance helps. You can make all the difference in the world. And so many Many people today are getting away from the congregation, even though it is it is a biblical thing. We see that we are supposed to be coming together as a group. And one thing that we, another thing that we see in the Bible that's going away in a lot of churches because they're just so desperate to get people, we see churches are actually supposed to even throw some people out. Now, how can you do that if you're not a congregation? How can you do that if you're just like a home church or something? You can't. You can only do this in a legitimate congregation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Okay? So you got a guy in your church that needs to be removed from the church. This is just showing how legitimate a church is and the authority that they have. Paul's telling them, you need to get rid of this guy. He says, for I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He said, when you come together, all right, that's called church attendance right there. That's called the assembling of the believers. He said, you need to remove this man from you. You need to deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He says, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You need to keep the leaven out of the church. You need to keep false doctrine out of the church. You need to keep sin and wickedness out of the church. That's what he's teaching right here. And he's talking about people. In this situation, you got to get them out. It says in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to accompany with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then ye must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Look at this. This is if any man be called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, was such an one, no, not to eat. Right here he's saying, if any that is called a brother, all right, if there's someone that's a part of your church, part of your congregation, and they are involved in these things, he's saying, don't fellowship with them. He's saying, remove them from the congregation. You can't do this if you're not a congregation, if you're not assembling and you say, well, that's terrible. We have no right to throw someone out of the congregation. Well, actually we do because one, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst, meaning he recognizes the authority of what they're doing. And actually we do because it was God that actually commanded us to do this very thing to keep these people out. And now outside the church, that's another story. You know, there's people all over this community that do this type of wickedness. There's nothing that we can do about it. Our authority does not go outside our church. But it says in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Do you know what Paul's telling them to do here? 
Paul is telling them, you judge those who are within. Now, that just kills everybody's favorite verse, judge not lest you be judged, all right? Not realizing that's talking about, you know, hypocritical judgment. We are supposed to judge things as a church. A church has a right to throw people out. A church has a right to judge within the church. They have a right to do that. We're supposed to do that. And that is a, a part of the responsibility of a congregation. And yet many people today, they act like they are following all, you know, Paul's epistles. They're following Hebrews, you know, chapter 10, when they're just meeting together, you know, watching TV preachers, watching internet preachers or whatever. They think that counts as church attendance. No, it, they, it does not count as church attendance. And listen, Many there are there are many problems in churches today. I could spend a whole nother half hour talking about junk that's going on in churches today. But listen, you I'm telling you, there's always going to be some place that you can meet. There's always going to be some assembly that you can find, and you know, none of them is going to be perfect, and neither are you. And you know what? I'm sick of listening to these people talk about how strong they are in their doctrine and how they're not going to compromise on whatever, but they all compromise when it comes to forsaking the assembly. They all compromise when it comes to provoking one another to love and to good works and to exhorting people and praising God in the congregation. They're all willing to compromise on that. But you know what their real problem is? Their real problem, I think, can be found in Proverbs 20, verse 6. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. And boy, we've got a lot of people out there beating their chest, talking about how good they are, talking about how bad everyone else is, talking about how strong they are on their doctrine and how they're not going to bend and they're not going to budge. And, you know, they're not going to go to church until they find one that is worthy of them. Most men will proclaim everyone his goodness, his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. You know what? It's hard to find people who actually are faithful, people who actually will make it through the hard times. And churches go through tough times. Churches have faults, and that church has a responsibility to remove that leaven. Well, listen, if you really are the good guy in that church, you know, wouldn't it help if you tried to help them remove the leaven instead of them removing all the good stuff, you know, and you just removing yourself? But the truth is, you people aren't the good stuff in church. You're the hypocrites. You're the ones driving everybody away from church. You know what? I'm sick of people who proclaim their own goodness. There's a lot of those out there, but you know what? I think there's a massive shortage of today, and that is the faithful. Listen, if you really are faithful, you're going to be faithful across the board to things of God. You're not going to just throw out massive portions of, of scripture you know, just because you're not going to bend on this one uh, little secondary doctrine, that's what you do. A faithful person, they're going to do the right thing no matter what. They're going to keep going to church, even if it gets boring at times, even if it's difficult, even if they got people in that church that have a lot of issues. Well, we see that we're supposed to restore those that are weak in the faith, and we're supposed to uh, encourage other people. We're supposed to lift others up. We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. You can't do that stuff. When you're sitting on your fat can, on your couch, at home, watching church and television, just reading your Bible by yourself, you can't do that. You need to be a part of a congregation. And if you really are in a place where there are just no good churches, then you need to move. And the truth is, if you're listening to this radio today, you don't have that excuse. And most people listening on the internet, they don't have that excuse. And you need to stop looking for excuses to not go to a church and start looking for excuses to go to a church. I'm willing, I'll be, I'd be willing to put up with a lot of junk if it means I can assemble with the believers. It doesn't mean I'm going to be compromising on my beliefs and compromising on my doctrine, but I don't, well, I, I'm not planning on compromising on my beliefs and my doctrine. I'm not planning on compromising when it comes to the assembling of the believers and praising God in the congregation and exhorting one another to love and good works. I'm not going to compromise on those things either. And so I hope this is a motivation to you. I hope you will get your carcass in church today. Go out there, 
be a blessing to someone, stop thinking about yourself, start thinking about others, and be obedient. So I hope this was a blessing. Thank you for listening to the Spirit of Liberty broadcast. Hope you can come visit our church sometime. Check out our website, givemelibertybaptist.com. God bless you, and we will see you next week.